All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's wonderful to see you all here. I'm Jeannie Chowning. I'm the Senior Director of Science Education and Training at Fred Hutch. And um, welcome to the latest installment of our Hutch at Home series. Particularly delighted uh, to have um, our group of community health educators joining us today to talk about public health and um, the jobs that they play. And um, I know that um, you'll likely enjoy this a great deal too. And so thanks, thanks for tuning in. Just some quick reminders that this is a talk geared towards science teachers and their students. And we often have other folks um, who find us through other means. Um, and just to remember to try to prioritize the questions um, from the students and teachers, please. Please mute yourself if you're not talking, especially if you're connecting via a phone. And feel free to add questions into the chat. Um, we can address questions as we go along, and then we'll also have some time for Q&A at the end. And then I'll come back at the end of the talk and give you some information about um, completing a feedback form that gives us some some um, information for the future. And we always like to hear your thoughts about our sessions. So um, without further ado, I'm uh, excited to introduce Dante Moorhead, Dylan von Rensberg, and Craig D, who are going to provide a panel um, related to this uh, job role and tell you a little bit about how they got to be where they are today. And so I am going to stop sharing um, okay and um dylan I, i'm driving your presentation too right or would you like to do it uh, if you could do that that would be great thanks yes yep so i'll go ahead and put that up now and uh, show another view and i'm going to screen and here we go. All right, everybody good? Awesome, okay. thank you yeah. so much. Yeah, and so I'll just turn it over to, to you to get started. Sure, well, of course, from all three of us, we wanna say thank you so much for letting us be here today. We are part of the Fred Hutch's Office of Community Outreach and Engagement. So as the name suggests, we focus on outreach and engagement and there's multi levels on how we do that here as a part of the OCOE. And we love to share a little bit about what that looks like in our day to day roles as health educators. You can go on to the next slide, that would be great. So I will start with myself then. So my name is Dylan Van Rensburg. I am a community health educator and I specifically focus on rural populations as part of the OCOE. And we'll actually go into a little detail on what do I do day in and day out. So Jeannie, if you can go to the next slide. Um, I first wanted to start off with though, with the idea of what is public health and healthcare is a really large industry. Um, a lot of the times, at least when I grew up, I always thought of doctors and nurses and it's really multi-dimensional. It's way more than just that. And we, in my opinion, represent a really unique industry focusing on prevention and control. So this is the general definition from the Centers for Disease Control. I highlighted two words in particular that I liked, protecting and improving. I thought that was very accurate for what we do. And it really coincides with this idea that we focus on prevention, health prevention. How do we prevent diseases from happening in the first place? And if they do, how do we prevent them from getting worse? That's the control part. And of course, we wanna move forward. We wanna keep our society being healthier and stronger and living long, more prosperous lives. We can go on to the next slide then. So kind of my background. Okay, so my start. So when I was 16 years old, I wanted to get involved in a volunteer program. And I was looking around and a friend of mine actually approached me and said that I would be good for this program called Teen Council. It's a part of Planned Parenthood. And you go around through different, uh, through the district and you get to go to different schools and talk about sexual health and dating violence prevention. And it was kind of my first insight on there's actually an industry called public health and doing this kind of work. And so I applied and I got accepted and I was like, okay, I'm gonna keep doing this. So I did it for three years through high school. And I knew when I went to college that I wanted to do something with health education. And so then I went to Western Washington University up in Bellingham. 
And uh, originally I wanted to be a health teacher through the Woodland Calling College of Education. I decided that wasn't the route I wanted to go. I thought I'd be a music teacher. And then I settled on the fact that now I want to I want to be a public health uh, expert. I want to work in public health. And so I ended up going into the community health program at Western. And I did that for about three years. And I did my internship at Swedish Cancer Institute, uh, working in the cancer education department. And it's kind of led me into this new field now. So we can go on to the next slide. Uh, so my first gig. In public health, I, after graduating, I ended up working at CMAR Community Health Center as a care coordinator. And I think that this was to me one of the biggest, most eye-opening positions really that I've held, um, or at least one of them in all my life, because what my job entitled through care coordination was helping individuals with multiple chronic health conditions overcome barriers to their health. And so of course, being a young guy that I am, um, these are a lot of challenges that people face every day. and it was um, really eye-opening. So helping people get to their appointments, um, people remembering their appointments, uh, helping people navigate the healthcare system through Medicare, through Medicaid, these big insurance names, it gets really complicated. And so it was my job to work specifically with 52 individuals and to help them get through their day-to-day -day as far as their healthcare needs. Um, yeah, so next slide. And so I did that gig for about a year. And then I knew I wanted to be a health educator. That's what I went to college for. It was actually really more for health education oriented. And I ended up getting my certification in, in health education. And that led me to my new gig now, which is here at Fred Hutch as part of the OCOE. So my job, like I said, I work as the community health educator for rural populations. And what that means is that we have a 13 county catchment area and I focus on what we designate as rural designated counties. So out of the 13, I focus on nine counties with most of them residing on the Washington State Peninsula. And I focus on all different aspects of, um, of prevention for cancer. Uh, primarily right now though, I've been focusing a lot of my work on colorectal cancer prevention. So if you can see in the bottom right photo, um, that's actually kind of a sneak peek on a video that we're doing. Uh, one of the things we do as health educators is we get to go out and do public presentations or normally we get to. And so we would be able to take our giant inflatable colon out. Its name is CC or colorectal education and cancer exhibit. And we get to talk about uh, colorectal cancer prevention. You know, what does that look like? Uh, what is the colon? Where is that in our bodies? What are these things called polyps? Uh, how do we prevent colorectal cancer in the first place? And the real answer is besides lifestyle choices, it's through uh, regular screenings. And so that's what this video talks about since we can't do public presentations like we could before. Uh, most of our office has really transformed into a digital media presence and I'm very excited for that. This new innov innovations that we're doing and this is just one of them, this video talking about colorectal cancer prevention. I mean, as you can see in the top left corner, I also put, we, we do other types of education materials as well. This is just one of them. I might we do social media posts that go out daily. We, uh, we're working on doing podcasts as well. So we're having all these different avenues to be able to share education, talk about prevention and promotion um, through digital media. Uh, in the bottom left corner, one of the events that I was in charge to do this year was the Health and Wellness Festival. That's one of our signature events as part of the Office of Community Outreach and Engagement. And that's my colleague, Lisa, our colleague, Lizette there as well. She's one of the other health educators. And she, um, oh, basically this event takes place in South Seattle. It takes place at Rainier Beach Community Center. And the theme of the event is minority health awareness. So we get to have all these organizations come and I was in charge of trying to coordinate everything and keep my head on my shoulder the whole time. Uh, Lizette is in that photo and she's actually leading the children's education table. So kids could go up and uh, dress up as scientists for a day. So that we thought that was super fun, but otherwise it's very educational for both adults and children who come. So we do events like that. And then in the top right corner, that's our, our at least part of our team, uh, the health educators and our administrator, Kathy. We also, of course, focus a lot on health education, but also on research as well. So that's us doing some research presentations. Um, again, like I said, most of my research focuses on colorectal cancer prevention. And so I've been doing a lot of presentation works and outreach according to that. So I think with that, we can go on to the next slide. That's a brief introduction for myself. So I'll kind of hand it off to my colleague then.
Okay, um, thanks, Dylan. Um, I appreciate it. And so my name is Dante. Um, I am one of the community health educators and researchers here for the Office of Community Outreach and Engagement. And um, as Dylan kind of briefly touched on, we just kind of have different focuses. And I am the health educator and researcher for African American populations or communities of color. And um, what we do as an office, uh, we work with, we do a lot of work in health equity and disparities research and outreach and engagement to marginalized or underserved communities of color. And um, we do this in our catchment area of Western Washington. What we learned is that certain, or what we know is that certain populations and areas are more at risk for cancer and lately COVID as well, more, than, more so than others. And so we engage these populations and raise cancer awareness through um, community-based participatory research. And um, I know that Dylan touched a little bit on public health and I really didn't have much to add to that definition, but I would probably add for me, it's more, public health to me is more a cooperative method of science. It's dedicated to improving the health of outcomes of all people, regardless of race, ethnicity, culture, and just preventing the spread of, you know, of infectious diseases. And I think that we have the opportunity to do that as health educators um, through outreach and engagement and research and just um, a bi-directional approach with underserved communities. So um, you can go to the next slide, please. And so as health educators, I just kind of jotted down a few of the things that we do, um, as well as developing content. And we do, for example, population research and studies that involve focus groups, creating instrumentation surveys, going out into the field. Um, we help and contribute to grant writing process and technical assistance. So we help on a lot of studies that TIs are doing. Dylan mentioned some of his focus areas were in colorectal cancer, for example. I have some focus areas in prostate cancer outcomes for African American men. That's a huge one. And um, of course, we do outreach and engagement. So part of what a big part of what we do is to connect with underserved communities, connect with our populations, and to assess their needs in a bi-directional approach. Our goal is to work with the communities through engagement, not just show up and tell you what, what we need. We have to hear both sides. Um, we do do a lot of panel discussions and speaking engagements and presentations. Um, being that the role has been switched to uh, virtual due to COVID, we are developing a lot of educational content and a lot of social media content as well. Um, we, as Dylan mentioned, we are working on a video series, a podcast series. We develop content for Facebook and Twitter. We've written um, emails and op-eds and just a lot of virtual content to share resources and education with people. Um, again, community-based participatory research is our main focus in this office. And that's probably the big one because, again, we reach out to these communities through engagement and we get a, a feel for their needs as well. And so we kind of work together. A lot of our partners and um, community-based organizations are on the ground floor of the things that we try to do. We try to involve them as much as we can in every step of the way from whether we are developing content to whether we are conducting a study or recruitment for tr clinical trials or any types of education. And um, this is important that we feel. Um, you can go to the next slide as well. And so some of the things that we have done, for example, as, as an example of that, of that outreach and education, you can see there's on the left, there's a picture. We uh, have a giant inflatable colon that we call CC, and it's a very good tool used for education. It's very popular. Um, whenever we take it out to events, we walk people through the colon and we talk to them about colorectal cancer and colorectal cancer awareness and things like that. You can see in the middle some of the educational material that we create for awareness for prostate cancer and we talk to people and we hand those out. Um, props to Craig as well, my colleague who helped develop that specific infographic there in the middle. And um, this particular event was at an event in Everett, I believe, where we went to um, a festival and there's again Lizette who is not here with us today but we like to keep make sure she's included but there's Dylan and Lizette and again we were talking to the community and handing out information and giving um, you know speeches on health education and awareness. You can go to the next slide, thank you. Um, there's a picture of me in front of the giant colon again giving a talk. I do not like that picture, I don't know who took it but whatever but again we were in um, I believe we were in, I don't know where we were at, where were we? Oh, but we had a big crowd that day. It was a community health education event. Um, and we brought the call in because they asked us to. And we also had some other vendors there as well. And then we gave, we had a presentation on healthy foods as well. So we got to talk to the community again about colorectal cancer awareness. 
Um, in some of our events, we do get to meet very important people, hence the pictures, as you can see, if you're familiar with who April Ryan is. I went to a breakfast with her and the Urban Metropolitan um, Group of Seattle, and she was the featured speaker there. And so I got to speak with her afterwards about some initiatives that she was working on. And there's a picture of her on stage or whatever. And so among meeting people out in the community, we get to work with different researchers and scientists and physicians and things like that. And that's one of the things that I personally love about Fred Hutch is that a person who can be discovering the cure for cancer is literally one building away or right across from the hall from you. And you can easily go and knock on their door just to say hi or just to meet with them or set up a, a, a coffee time. And so that's good. So um, being at the Hutch and doing community events like that affords us the chance to meet many people and to do many things with the community. Next slide, please. And so here's a couple other examples of some fun things we did. Um, we had the Pumpkin Beer Festival that was recently in Seattle. We, again, took the colon out there. Um, shout out to Lizette again doing her thing. Um, it was amazing the response that we got at the Pumpkin Beer Festival when we brought the colon out there. Um, surprisingly, a lot of people were very interested in learning about colorectal cancer during a beer festival, and it was quite busy. And so we do get a lot of traffic, and it, it seems to me that when it comes to health education awareness and public health, it feels like a lot of people want to hear what we have to say, especially when we are trying to change healthy behaviors. And on the right, there's a picture that we did with one of our partners from Sierra Sisters, that is Bridget Hempstead. And we did World Cancer Day that we hosted um, with her at the Langston Hughes Memorial Center. It was a great event for communities, communities of color. And one of the things I like to do is highlight the, the, the wonderful work that um, communities of color are doing and advocates. And so we had black female physicians out there talking about the work that they do in cancer and some of the initiatives that they're taking. And we got to be a part of that event and putting that together. And so it was another good time. So we do get out and about in the community as part of the public health work that we do. Um, next slide, please. And so on top of that, we do other projects. I don't know if you can see those, but um, as far as like publications and research, um, the one on the left is a presentation that I did for the um, school district in Tacoma Pierce County Schools. And we were trying to increase initiatives for HPV vaccine awareness and to start a student-led vaccine campaign program. And I paired with uh, Tacoma Pierce County Public Health to do that. And so we wrote a proposal for the school district on that. Um, the one in the middle is a publication about exercise recommendations for prostate cancer, one of my pet projects. Um, with Dr. Nelson's group here at Fred Hutch, we were able to do a short exercise video and a community uh, living with cancer app that will be coming out shortly. And I helped film a video and I helped to write some of the low impact exercise recommendations and why it's important for men with cancer. And then the one on the right is a grantee project that I'm working on again, in prostate cancer. And we can see uh, the group is the Communities of Color Coalition, and they are using surveys and focus groups to determine the risk factors for African-American men and African descent men in Snohomish County. And so we will be conducting that research project this upcoming year. And so I'm a mentor or am um, a technical assistant, and I help put together that study as well. So we are involved in population research, health education, community work, and just all of the above. Um, and I think that's it for me. Next slide, please. And so, yeah, um, and I just wanted to shout out to my kid here. He turned four on Saturday, but uh, the one in the picture in the middle was an event, again, that Lisette and I did, and we paired with the Mount Church, with the Mount Zion Baptist Church in Seattle to host a breast cancer event for their breast cancer um, support group. And we wanted to have a health and a health and wellness day or on a Saturday morning to talk about breast cancer awareness for women of color and to reach out to that community. We also did a walk and we had some exercise activities indoors and I got to bring my kid to that and it looks like he had a great time. Um, and so, yeah, so it's kind of like a bring your kid to work. And so that's kind of my journey to public health. I originally started out my journey in molecular and cellular biology. That's what I went to undergrad for. Um, but upon working in healthcare, getting sick myself, and learning more about the social determinants, I chose to try to pursue something that merged more social uh, behavior with the science that I already knew, and I wanted to affect um, health outcomes in a, in a better way, while also doing some 
community advocate work and stuff like that. And so I ended up going into public health after my bachelor's in healthcare studies and molecular and cellular biology, and I pursued my master's in that field. I ended up in Seattle, and for the first nine to 10 months, I was just on dialysis and getting chemo every other week. And as soon as I was able to come off dialysis, I got an internship with the Pacific Science Center where I worked in uh, vaccines and the community response. And it was there I met some scientists from UW and Fred Hutch, and they suggested that I look and see what's going on in Fred Hutch, and I did. And I ended up with this wonderful organization and I got to do some great, and I am doing some great work into public health. And so that's a little bit about my journey and some of the things that we do. And I believe that's it, you can go to the next slide. And I guess we'll let our colleague Craig take it from here. Thanks, Dante. Uh, hello everyone, hello everyone. My name is Craig D. I'm a community health educator and uh, community health educator for indigenous populations, uh, working with Dylan, and Dante and Lizette as well. Uh, I'm an enrolled member of the Navajo Nation. Uh, I moved up here in Washington State uh, about almost 30 years ago from Albuquerque, New Mexico. Um, and loving it so far. I love in the foggy weather and the sun today is reminding me a bit about New Mexico and uh, sometimes I do enjoy the sun after all. Um, next slide, please. All right, so just to quickly review where my roots lie, uh, the picture on the left is a picture of Shiprock Rock. Uh, there, there's a town just uh, north of that rock that is called Shiprock, of course. And that's where I was born, and it's near uh, the Four Corner area of um, New Mexico. And uh, yeah, and so uh, the picture on the right there is a picture of where I grew up, which is the Tohajule, New Mexico. Um, and it's a satellite reservation of the Navajo Nation. And so what that means is that uh, there's a lot, a, a small part, uh, I guess, a, a land that was given to the Navajo or was owned by the Navajo um, that's not part of the main Navajo reservation. And it's located near, closer to Albuquerque, New Mexico. Um, so yeah, next slide, please. All right, and to kind of explain what public health means to me, Dylan Dante gave an explanation of what public health means to them and then the general uh, definition of public health. But for me, public health, uh, incorporates everything that surrounds uh, me as far as an individual and as a collective of indigenous peoples uh, across uh, the United States. And so um, this picture here is a picture of what we call the medicine wheel. And this medicine wheel incorporates a, a spiritual, emotional, physical, and mental well-being. And each of these colors represents uh, each of those uh, aspects of a uh, medicine will. Uh, so when we look at medicine um, in a Western context, it's talking about the biomedical uh, aspect of um, what medicine is basically. And uh, for this, with the medicine will incorporates everything, it incorporates all that we are as human beings. And it also incorporates more of uh, the community and everything about us. Um, so when we talk about spiritual uh, and physical well being, you know, there's an emotional aspect to those things as well. Um, and so, yeah, public health to me is all about um, making sure for my people and for my indigenous relatives located throughout Indian country here in Washington state, uh, it means to be healthy. Uh, it's more of a holistic view of health uh, rather than focusing on the, the medical or the bio, uh, biomedical aspect of medicine. Um, next slide, please. Um, so yeah, just kind of give a, a little context uh, to this picture of the community grant writing workshop. Um, 
I won't go into much detail about my role specifically with uh, community health education. I think Dante and uh, Dylan cover that pretty well. Uh, so thank you guys. Um, but one of the signature events that we do in the Office of Community Outreach and Engagement is the Community Grant Writing Workshop. The picture here is uh, the workshop this past uh, January, uh, so pre-COVID. Uh, so basically what the Grant Writing Workshop is, is that we invite uh, our community partners or leaders within uh, community organizations to apply for a, a community grant of uh, $10,000 and up. And these community grants are geared towards uh, looking for preventative measures or looking for prevention efforts to uh, lower cancer health disparities, increase uh, cancer screening rates, or um, developing education materials to uh, hosting an event that would contribute to uh, lowering cancer health disparities. And so some of the uh, organizations represented here are the Communities of Color Coalition, uh, CMAR, uh, Community Health Centers, uh, Sierra Sisters, um, what's another one, and the American Cancer Society. And each of these uh, uh, organizations were uh, present during this workshop and they were able to look at how to um, uh, apply for a grant, how to write for a grant, what makes a grant uh, application uh, successful and what strengthens uh, a grant. And so uh, each of these organizations are paired with a faculty member of the Cancer Consortium. Uh, so within the Cancer Consortium, it includes uh, Seattle uh, Children's Hospital, uh, Seattle Cancer Care Alliance, Fred Hutch, and the University of Washington. And each of these, uh, each of the faculty there are there to help uh, the uh, organizations and support them on writing these grants and uh, provide uh, expertise within their um, within their field. Sorry, my little dog is playing with this toy. I don't know if you can hear that. Um, but anyways, uh, let's see here. And yeah, and so each of these organizations were um, granted a up to $10,000 to implement some of their projects. And uh, it was super exciting to uh, work with uh, some of these organizations. And um, yeah, next slide, please. All right, um, and so another part of what we do is uh, identify, I think uh, Dante mentioned this, is that we identify cancer health disparities uh, within the populations that we work with. And so for me, working with indigenous populations, we um, identify these cancer health disparities and look for partnerships and finding ways to create access for some of these communities to have uh, better uh, screening opportunities for cancer or for finding uh, uh, treatment options and identifying clinical trials that would um, allow their participa uh, participation. Um, however, COVID happened um, and our focus began to shift. And so uh, going back to the, the health disparities, we noticed that, um, or it was identified that COVID-19 exposed pretty much the, the gaps within our healthcare system. And within the healthcare system, um, indigenous people are hardly uh, ever uh, viewed as a community that um, has good access to or doesn't have access to much of uh, healthcare resources. And uh, part of the reason why is that they, uh, some of the tribal communities are heavily underfunded when it comes to their healthcare. And uh, going further, it was found that they are in serious uh, need of per personal protective equipment. And so uh, given the context and our mission as an Office of Community Outreach and Engagement and where we work at Fred Hutch, we decided to uh, start this uh, personal protective equipment drive, which is for tribal and urban Indian healthcare facilities and programs. So we've partnered with 
various tribal entities such as the Seven Directions, uh, which is the Center for Indigenous uh, Public Health at the University of Washington, as well as the Indigenous uh, Wellness Re Research Institute and the School of Social Work at the University of Washington. And so we created this uh, drive to uh, bring awareness to some of the issues and the, some of the disparities that Indigenous people are facing throughout Washington State and uh, bringing awareness to that uh, they are lacking uh, personal protective equipment. Um, and so here's a, a flyer that we developed and there's a few ways that you can um, donate. One is bring your supplies to a donation site, uh, which, we will, which we will be uh, uh, communicating soon. So stay tuned on that or you can ship items via our Amazon wish list. You can scan the QR code or type in the URL there. Or if you already have supplies to donate or need to contact us for uh, other reasons, uh, there's our email address there. Um, next slide, please. Oh, that's about it. Um, so just to kind of fill you in about uh, my role with indigenous populations too, is that as a community health educator, uh, my job is not only to communicate uh, cancer prevention and clinical trials and so forth uh, to the community, but my job is also to communicate Fred Hutch and our partners about Indigenous communities as well uh, when it comes to tribal sovereignty, when it comes to uh, tribal institutional review boards, uh, when it comes to doing research with Indigenous communities. Uh, my role is to fill that gap and to bridge both the community and Fred Hutch. So. Thank you. Thank you so much. Craig, what, what was it that kind of got you into um, public health in the first place? Like what was your journey to where you are in your role now? How did that happen for you? Um, for me, I honestly, um, I grew up in the Navajo reservation and seeing how inadequate healthcare is within my community and being, uh, I guess, affected by the lack of resources. Um, I knew that, you know, my colleagues at the university were getting much higher, <laughs> much better healthcare than I was or my family or my community or my nation. And so, uh, you know, I began my research there at the University of New Mexico, identifying some of the, uh, the health disparities and figuring out that, you know, uh, that the U.S. government has a trust obligation to uh, provide health care for indigenous populations throughout uh, the United States. And so, um, yeah, I decided that public health it was just one of those things that I could, um, you know, be, be an advocate for my people and be an advocate for indigenous relatives. Thank you so much. Um, we are going to have a chance for the audience here to do um, some Q&A with folks. And uh, there was a question that came in on our pre-submit form. Um, so it sounds like you mainly work with communities that you yourself identify with or share ethnic background with. Um, but uh, it says, if not, what are some techniques you have used to diversify yourself so that you can better understand other others' perspectives? So are you you know, working in, in other contexts where you may not have as much um, knowledge or experience or cultural background, how, what do you do to learn um, and how do, you, how do you go about that? And it, it could be from, from, we can hear from anyone uh, who has an idea here. Yeah, I think I can start with that. Um, for my position, I focus on geographical areas. I, I did not grow up in a rural community. I grew up in an urban setting, but my first career started in a rural sector, and that's how I got involved with it. And in the rural designated counties here in Washington, we have very much a diverse community up there. I have been doing a lot of work up in the North Sound, working with the um, Promotores de Salud program up there working with migrant farm workers and uh, working with many different languages, including indigenous languages like Mixteco, Awakateco, or Treki. These are indig indigenous languages that are familiar there. Um, and so the way that I kind of diversify or get familiar with, with them, uh, build trust with them is through what we call community-based participatory practices. 
And so I get to work with these individuals and any projects that we work come up with together, um, it's together. And I work with them and they be able to help guide any projects that we do through every step of the process. So that's just one approach that we do that we learn in our education how to do. Um, and the other answer is that it just takes time and it takes time and dedication and showing up and not always coming with an agenda. A lot of the times I always just check in with individuals and just to see, hey, how are things going? And uh, what do you guys wanna work on in the future if you do? And, Sometimes they have answer, answers and sometimes they don't, and, it, and it's perfectly fine. But a lot of the times, uh, people in rural communities are very eager. They are very smart and want to be able to do these types of projects. And so we go for it, and we go for it together as a team. Uh, would you guys add anything? Um, I would just say, I mean, you pretty much know it on point. One of the things that I would say is um, I've been lucky enough to have experts on our staff. For example, I lean on Craig's expertise for a lot of indigenous things like that. But when I'm interested in learning more, the research is actually out there and you, you can network and get a lot of connections that way. But the important thing is to approach with a sense of humility and be willing to listen because a lot of people are willing to talk, but not many people are willing to listen. And there are a lot of people out there with PhDs, DVCs, whatever behind their name, but I also believe in the importance of lived experience. And I think that a lot of people bring that to the table when they have something to teach you. And so you just have to be willing um, to listen and you have to be willing to go find the information. Um, I do a lot of advocating for my people but I'm also aware that the work I do requires me to be responsible and help my colleagues advocate for their people as well. And so when, I, when the need arises, um, I make the effort to really, really learn and to really, really listen and to lean on the experts that I have at my disposal. So if you know someone, you know someone, you shouldn't have any issues with going and talking to them and be prepared to listen, be prepared to learn and be prepared to follow up. I'm a firm believer in knowing when to lead and when to follow. And when there are certain things that are out of my realm, I have no problem with following because that's how you learn and that's how you grow. So, I mean, Dylan basically touched on everything, but I think in order for me to diversify, that's what I do. I humble myself and I find the experts. And if they're willing to talk, I'm certainly willing to listen and I'm willing to put in the work and just kind of tumble down the rabbit hole and just learn more and more. Good. Craig, did you have anything you wanted to add to that? Um, not at all. I think they hit it pretty well. Um, and, you know, I would agree with both of them by humbling yourself and listening. Uh, yeah. Those two are the most important things to do. When and Craig, I don't know, did you want to also talk about, we have our CAC as well. Do you want to mention, talk about that? The Community Action Coalition? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, of course. Area. So yeah, um, to help answer that question as well, we also uh, have a community action coalition, which is comprised of community partners or community organizations that we partner with that are more of, um, or organizations that are more at the grassroots level who are at the, the, you know, the front lines of prevention. And so we partner with them and invite them to be part of this coalition. And um, basically this coalition drives our work. Um, you know, we um, partner with them on working with some of the communities that they serve, but they have the absolute say so on how and when and where and so forth on how to engage with those communities. And so, yeah. Great. Thank you so much. Um, I happen to know that there are some students on the call who are interested in public health and community health education as a possible career. Uh, any words of advice um, or thoughts for somebody who's maybe just uh you know in high school or undergrad thinking about this okay i guess i can go <laughs> um i would say well first of all you you if you're younger and undergrad like that in high school i would say number one is that you have plenty of time to make mistakes you don't have to figure it out immediately i'm not saying don't don't figure it out at all i'm just saying that um, trial and error is not trial and error is not necessarily a bad thing. You you're at the point in your life where if you decide to go one direction and that doesn't work out, you can change it. Um, you're young enough to do that. I would also say, to it's networking is important from a standpoint where you can do volunteer work. You can try to get internships. Um, it's not enough just to come out of school with a 4.0 GPA nowadays. You have to have some kind of experience or some kind of exposure to something. So meet people as many as you can learn go to sessions listen try to get internships volunteerism 
even if you have the opportunity to connect with somebody, like if I could bring Jeannie coffee every day, that's fine as long as she tells me about the work she's doing. So at least I'm getting some exposure. Yeah, you have to start small. And also when you come out of school, don't expect it to always hit it out of the park when you first stop. You know, just because you don't hit a home run when you first come out doesn't mean you won't be a Hall of Famer one day. So just take it in small steps. Um, look at the steps that it takes to get there. Use some positions as stepping stones to get to where you really want to be and plan for the long game. So my two biggest pieces of advice is don't ever give up. I know that sounds cliche. Um, and then um, networking and getting to know people. Expand your contacts and your network. Those are very important things. That's awesome advice. Uh, Dylan and Craig, do you have to add? Yeah, I think the only thing I would emphasize actually, not add, because that really summed it up. Um, the idea, especially if you're in high school, um, in, is uh, volunteering. I know Dante mentioned that. Um, I'll tell you, man, a lot of my experience and the, my foundation, I really attribute to all my volunteering that I did. Um, I learned so much from volunteering. And I think step one, if you're wondering what would be step one for me, is to kind of figure out what are some fields in public health that you're interested in and look to see if there's any public public health volunteer opportunities for them. There are tons of them and, and a lot of organizations offer them even for students who are in high school. They sometimes have specific programs for students in high school. So I take advantage of those, especially when you go into college, if you do decide to pursue college, um, it's great to have that experience under your belt. Awesome. And for me, I probably want to add, um, you know, as you're graduating high school or entering um, your, your college career, uh, you'll begin to start asking the question, why? Um, why is the healthcare, or from my perspective or my experience, I began to ask the question, why is healthcare like this for tribal communities? Why is it that we have to travel so far to have healthcare? And so if you begin to ask, excuse me, <laughs> uh, if, you give in, if you begin to ask the question why, then you'll start to learn about certain things and begin to discover um, some answers. And I think that would lead to uh, a career in public health or it, many other careers that um, help to address those type of questions. So. Excuse my dog for no, no. That's <laughs> uh, we we all get what that that's like to be at be at home and doing this. Um, so that that was awesome answers. Thank you so much. We did have one come through the chat. Um, what is the most significant adaptation you have made in order to carry out your mission in the COVID nineteen environment? So, um, you know, clearly we, this has restricted us. But how have you been adapting, and what is the most significant adaptation you've made? Either got an answer, I can go. Go ahead, Dylan. All righty. <laughs> uh, well, what I would say as far as for COVID-19, it completely changed everything um, about our systems of operation as part of the Office of Outreach and Engagement. I couldn't emphasize that enough. You know, before we were out in the communities, um, especially during the summertime, almost every day, um, out in different sectors of Western Washington, uh, talking about cancer prevention, talking about public health and, now for us, I think that the biggest adaption has been going to a digital media platform. Everything that we educated on, everything that we promoted thus far and improved on now has now been altered to go to those digital media formats so we can still adhere to physical distancing restrictions. Um, yeah, to add to that, basically everything is virtual now. A lot of our work, as Dylan mentioned, was predicated on being with people face to face, taking meetings, doing um, events. And so now with social distancing and the COVID, we've had to learn how to do everything virtually. That includes creating more content virtually and things like that. I've had to learn some more graphic design and things like that. Um, also for me on a personal level, like for example, I remember when COVID first hit, I remember receiving messages and emails about, do you have any data on, you know, underserved populations or how it's affecting communities and whatever? And I was like, not yet, but I know it's coming. And then all of a sudden overnight, it was boom, you know, indigenous or Hispanic or uh, African-Americans are really suffering from COVID. So that is definitely something I had to adapt to as a person of color. 
already dealing with um, the disparities and inequities that exist. And then all of a sudden we get hit with a pandemic and I've had to adapt to that as well. And one of the ways I've adapted to that is doing a lot of research and leaning on a lot of professional experts and to find certain outlets that allow me to to voice those to voice and express those um, concerns over the, the inequities and disparities that exist. And I think our office has done a better job of doing that. They let us talk about um, about more things like that because we've come to know that having a social justice component to our work is becoming important. And so, especially in dealing with COVID and the other things going on in our country right now. So while we're all indoors doing things virtually, this is one of the things that we have to deal with as well. I know that's something that I have to deal with. So um, yeah, that's how I've adapted is by having more of a voice to talk about these things and being more aggressive in talking about it as well as learning how to do more stuff online and taking Zoom meetings like literally every day. <laughs> And for me, the um, only thing I would add is uh, strengthening uh, partnerships with uh, tribal communities and organizations. Um, they also have shifted their focus as well. Um, when they had multiple programs running within their organization, they quickly adapted their own um, structure into focusing on COVID-19. And so my job was to be a supplement to some other efforts and um, be supportive and helpful as much as I can uh, when it comes to indigenous communities and many other communities as well. Um, so, yeah. Thank you. I think that the only thing that I actually would add to is that for us, we started off, of course, um, most of our work focused around cancer prevention and control. Um, it's since evolved, of course, because of COVID-19. How could we not focus on the topic of COVID-19 and educating about it to our community? So. Um, it's very integral. It's a part of our office. Um, we do focus on cancer cell, but we have added COVID-19 as a part of it. And you saw that with Craig's presentation talking about the PPE drive. Um, we're going to be continuing doing that work and it's still um, mission critical for Fred Hutch and as well as our office. Please feel free to either drop questions in the chat or you can unmute yourself. Love to hear, especially from some of our students on the call. What questions do you have? Um, I had a question, if I could, for any students interested, like what fields of STEM or science are you considering at this moment in time, if you were considering it, like are you interested in, like what are you just, what are you interested in as far as science or wanting to pursue in your college careers or beyond? You can put it in the chat too if you don't want to. <laughs> And now our students are being unusually uh, not not wanting to to chat with us, but I, there is a different question about what you oh somebody start oh what do you see as the biggest hurdle to achieving health equity? I'm not sure I got the question right because it looks like. Achieving heal, learn equity. So I'm guessing health equity. <laughs> Does anyone want to take that? That's a good question. Let me think about that one for a bit. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty, that's pretty big, right? It's pretty major. No, it's pretty multidimensional. Um, that's a big one. And I, I don't know if I have that answer. And I think if I did, I'd be in a, I don't know, I'd be somewhere else maybe if I had that answer, but I think there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of ways we have to go about doing it, but yeah, that's a, that's a tough one. Do you have an answer for that Dante at all or any thoughts? Oh, wow. How do you solve health equity? Um, I, I really don't, I can say that for now, one of the most, one of the, I would say if I had to narrow it down as best as I could, I could, I would say it's effort because it's such a big problem that you don't know where to attack it from, but the point is you have to keep attacking it until you're done. And so you need a lot of 
endurance, you need a lot of effort, and you don't want to give up, and you want to keep on pushing through whatever that hurdle is, because it's obviously a big hurdle. I would say there are so many hurdles, I wouldn't begin to tell you what the, what the biggest hurdle is. So for me, I would say it's just endurance or effort and the will to keep on going. I know that's probably sound cliche, but that's, that's what I got. And I actually, cliche. yeah, and, and to add to that, actually, but at least one, maybe one way that we could really overcome a lot of hurdles is through uh, systematic changes and policy. Um, that's definitely one big one, at least for me. I'm just speaking for myself. And no matter who you are, where you come from, what you look like, everyone should have the same opportunity. And it's not the case. That's why we have inequities. And so I think that if we can really drive and start having major policy changes in our country, around the world, um, those could bridge some, some gaps. That's just one way to look at it. That's one way to frame it. Craig, do you have uh, thoughts you'd like to add to that? Yeah. Big, big um, question. Yeah, Kay, thank you for asking that question. Um, I think we've all been asked that question by different forms. And um, I think for for me, my, my people, my community, and for my Indigenous relatives, um, I think it's about um, what Dylan was saying and along the lines of that, which is systemic change uh, to the healthcare system and even to uh, the government to government relationships for, with the US government and uh, the tribal communities. What a lot of people don't understand is uh, that there is a government to government relationship with tribal communities and the US government. And so if we begin to uh, look at that from, a, uh, from an indigenous perspective um, in a way that uh, Let's see here. Yeah, it's a very hard question. Um, I think that listening more about the community voice, listening more to indigenous communities on how they're able to uh, heal within their communities and provide healthcare within their own communities and not so much have a governmental, uh, US governmental uh, agenda, then I think that, you know, health equity can be achieved uh, on certain aspects. So all in all, it's just all about um, putting indigenous knowledge and traditions to the forefront of healthcare for indigenous communities and exploring ways how that could achieve health equity. Um, <laughs> that's, that's the best answer I can give yeah, you. It's, it's a very, um, yeah, tough question. Yeah, that's, that's very um, helpful to hear from from all of your perspectives and you each definitely sh you know shown a light on it from a different direction um, and we had a couple students responding um, one who's interested in pursuing neuroscience or biomedical science and then but is pretty flexible to pursue any field between biology or robotics as Jennifer Tran and then Sydney said uh, environmental and or conservation science education and so um, you know the folks that are interested in a wide variety of, of fields. Um, I have a question here from Joan. How do you respond to people who assume health differences between groups of people are mostly due to genetics? And that was kind of something I was thinking about when you were talking too, because one of the issues that we see come up um, when we we're doing some of our work is that rather than seeing something as structural, people will see uh, issue is something an individual or group of individuals has brought up upon themselves um, somehow either through their behavior or it's you know a genetic genetic uh, explanation so how how do you kind of respond to folks who who uh, maybe are ignoring some of the structural and social factors Another, another th thoughtful question. No, no, no. I mean, no, it, it depends on the conversation. Like, if it's an informal conversation, then I'd probably be petty and I'd be like, hey, well, let me cite you every source that ever existed that tells you that you're wrong. And then if I'm not, if I'm somewhere else, I would be like, okay, well, there's a lot of evidence based research that talk about the social determinants for, of health, for example. And it's basically, you can boil it down to a nature versus nurture argument. Um, your genetics are, are, are a part of it, but it's not the only component. You could be physically fit, perfectly, genetically fine and everything, but if you 
live in the south side of Chicago working at Wendy's making $10 an hour, your health outcomes are going to be a little different from somebody who lives in a suburban neighborhood in Maine or something like that. And so that's not all based on genetic. And there is work that cites that where you live, work, and play has, a genet has an effect on your health outcomes. Um, socioeconomics are a thing, um, income level are a thing, your race, ethnicity, and culture are a thing. Culture is very important as some cultures don't practice the same style of medicine. Craig has mentioned that um, certain tribes have traditional medicines and their whole practices may be at odds with Western medicine, for example. And so it's just different and very, it varies from culture to race to location to all these things. They have an important effect on your health outcome. So Dylan, did you have something? Yeah, I think the only thing I would add to that, see if someone said that to me, you know, I'd say, you know, I, I hear where you're coming from because I understand where your logic thinking with when it comes to genetics is genetics does play a huge role in our health. But what I would take it further though, is that genetic is one aspect. You know, when we talk about health or public health, it's multidimensional and w whether we think about it or not, everything in our life affects our health. Our environment affects our health. I mean, look at us now, we can't be in huge groups right now because of the environment that we live in, because of physical distancing restrictions. You know, we notice in certain areas and certain poorer communities, there's lower um, or there's greater health uh, risks living in those communities, you know, greater disparities. And so I think what I would encourage this individual is just to kind of look at health in a multitude of different lenses and let's have this conversation again at a later date. Nice. Craig, do you uh, have, have anything you want to add there? Yeah, yeah. Um, again, just putting on my indigenous lens here, um, I honestly would probably talk about the historical trauma and the acculturation of indigenous people and how that affects uh, some of the health outcomes today. Um, some of the governmental policies that were enacted uh, by the US government with indigenous communities or indigenous tribes or indigenous nations um, has, a, has sort of like a trickle down effect to uh, where we have some of the worst health outcomes throughout, uh, US, throughout the US and um, also throughout the world. Yeah, absolutely. So important for people to, to know about. Um, I am so glad that you could join us today. I would, um, Put, I'm going to put up uh, our closing slides, but while I do, could um, people give some uh, support and appreciation to our community health educators, either in the chat, you can unmute yourself, you can throw up a reaction, and um, I'm going to switch back to the, to the last slides here. All right. Great. Well, um, this has been super educational. I've, I've Loved working with you and it's also nice to learn a little bit more about you and what you do. Um, so thanks again for, for taking the time to join us today. Uh, for our audience, um, recordings and schedule are on our SEP news and events page. So please uh, keep your eye on that page. Um, you can have today's recording will be up uh, shortly and then you can also um, see, see what's coming up in the next few weeks. Um, next Tuesday, join us for um, Louisa Helms' presentation. Uh, Louisa is a graduate student in the Friedman Lab at the University of Washington, and she works at the Institute for Stem Cell and Regenerative Medicine. And she is planning to uh, talk about life in the lab, what do scientists actually do all day. And she's actually gone around video interviewing some of the people she works with. She has a little tour of her lab that she wants to show. And um, she is also the student, a former student of a, one of the SEP Fred Hutch teachers. And so uh, she's mentored teachers as part of giving back to the teacher community. So very involved in education as well. So hope, hope you can all join us next week and um, be sure to uh, also provide us feedback with our feedback form, there's a QR code. Um, there's the, the, uh, the URL and we just love to, to hear your thoughts about today. Uh, if you do have a chance, um, go to the, the Office of Community Outreach and Engagement it has a Facebook page, they have a newsletter, um, they have the PPE drive, that's a way that you can support their work and um, hope, hope that uh, 
you learned something about community health today. I know I certainly did. So thanks everybody for joining us. This has been wonderful um, and take good care. Have a great afternoon.